Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Unlocking Breakthroughs in Glioblastoma Research. Today's presentation will cover the development of a functional in vitro human blood-brain barrier in glioblastoma model to investigate mechanisms of drug resistance using AIM Biotech's Organics platform. If you're attending the Society for Neuroscience Conference in Washington, D.C. in November, you can find AIM at booth number 712. We will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of the talk and attendees are encouraged to submit questions throughout the presentation. The webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a copy of the recording as well as supporting references. Our presenter today is Dr. Maxine Lam. Maxine studied in Singapore and was awarded the A-STAR NSS BS PhD scholarship. She majored in genetics at the University of Wisconsin and graduated with a bachelor's degree in natural sciences. Maxine was accepted into the Wellcome Trust PhD program in developmental and stem biology at University College London, where she investigated the role of tissue tension on cell division using Drosophila as a model system. And her postdoc work at the Institute of Cancer Research focused on the role of cellular biomechanics in cancer extravasation, and she is currently working on developing physiologically relevant 3D models for cancer. So Maxine, I'll hand it over to you to begin the presentation. Hi, Margo. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for spending your Thursday morning or evening with me, depending on where you are. So for the next hour, I will be telling you a bit about my research into modeling glioblastoma and the blood-brain barrier and how the AIM Biotech Organics chip has helped us do just that. So the disease I've been working on the last few years is glioblastoma which is the most common brain or CNS malignancy affecting 3.23 per 100,000 people in the US. So it's not the most common in the population, which perhaps makes it a bit difficult to study. Treatment typically consists of maximally safe surgery, which is tricky given the importance of the brain's function, followed by radiotherapy, and since 2005, concurrent temozolomide. Um, recurrence is inevitable, with the anti-endogenic drug bepacizumab approved for recurrent GBM. While it improves progression-free survival, it does not improve overall survival. Unfortunately, the mean median survival for GBM is around 15 months, despite improvements in surgery and radiotherapy techniques, and essentially one chemotherapeutic option. Decades of research have revealed that GBM is complex and difficult to, do, to treat, with a multitude of factors such as age and molecular markers that affect the severity and treatment response. So GBM is notoriously difficult to treat for many reasons, and I'll begin with the structure of it. So GBM is characterized by a dense necrotic or hypoxic core surrounded by more invasive cells, and probably related to its dense nutrient sparse tumor core, the tumor tends to be proangiogenic. As a result, GBM tumors tend to be highly vascularized. Um, its invading cells migrate in an infiltrative pseudopalisating pattern along new and existing vessels in the perivascular space and in the parenchymal space, sometimes along axon tracts. So all of this make it very difficult to surgically, surgically resect completely. So as mentioned, GBM tumors have a very close relationship with the vasculature in the brain. The brain's vasculature is a highly specialized structure with parasites wrapping around the basal sides of the endothelial cells and acidic end feet and interneurons contacting the vessels. So I'm gonna to switch to, um, sorry, my laser pointer so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Right. So here you can see the um, kind of cross section of the, how the different BBB cells interact. So, Together, these cell types form the, what is known as the blood-brain barrier, or BBB, and they ensure that its highly controlled and selective permeability fulfills its main function of preventing toxins from entering the brain. But this selective um, permeability also means that most standard chemotherapy drugs are not able to cause the BBB. And so chemotherapy options for GBM are limited to small molecule, small molecular weight drugs such as temozolomide, and potentially also modified immune cells, which is something that I'll talk about later. So the, G the BBB has actually been known to be disrupted in, the G in GBM, but rather than increasing access to drugs, 
can sometimes lead to these therapies leaking out at non-tumor regions. So a leaky BDD can also lead to edemas and hemorrhaging in patients, which is incredibly debilitating. And mentioned before, it can be hijacked um, by the tumor for nutrients and invasion. And the anti-angiogenesis drug bepicizumab is used to treat recurrent BGBM. So it improves patient symptoms, but it and probably by treating the edemas, but it doesn't improve overall patient survival. So here is where I stand on my soapbox and I tell you why 3D models are important for not just disease and um, modeling, um, but also, uh, yeah, so, sorry, let me just start again. <laughs> so this is where I tell you why 3D models are important for all diseases, not just GPM. So um, this is how almost all drug development happens right now. So you identify a candidate drug from a 2D assay, where the chances of overestimating drug efficacy are very high because it's just a drug and the cell in a simple environment. And then you take that candidate drug and you move into your animal studies, where months later you find that for some reason your drug doesn't work. It could be because the drug uptake has issues or there's presence of uh, inhibitory cell types or differences in muscular physiology. And it's all very hard to untangle because it's inside the animal. So however, I'm hoping to convince you today that we need to start incorporating 3D models in this pipeline. Um, models that have just the right amount of complexity and don't take months to assay. So with these advanced 3D models, we can potentially identify features in the tumor microenvironment that can affect therapy efficacy much earlier, which allows us to then iterate, maybe back in 2D, these therapies faster and reducing our overall need for large animal studies. So, and in turn, this is potentially able to reduce the overall time and cost associated with therapy development. So how have we gone about modeling GBM and its tumor microenvironment, or TME for short? So I'm going to gloss over about one year of optimization and present basically what looks like an embarrassingly simple protocol. So we start with modeling the solid tumor. For this, we use either immortalized commercial GBM cell lines or patient-derived cell lines, and we've opted for the hanging drop method to form spheroids. So key to this is forming spheroids of at least 500 microns in diameter, as you can see in this image here. So, because previous studies have shown that this is kind of the minimal size for observing the core versus periphery phenotypes, such as necrosis and hypoxia that we want to see. And then for the BBB, we resuspend a mix of primary and mesutial cells, parasites and astrocytes in a hydrogel. And we pipette the mix of BBB cells and the spirit into the, the central gel chamber of the AIM Biotech organic device here. So, here is a close up look at the organics device. Um, you can see that in the central gel chamber in both the cartoon and the video are in red. And when I start the video, you'll see, what you'll see is that the side channels are going to be filled in with this blue liquid here. Um, and so for our GBM and BB model, the tumor steroid and the BBB cells are in the central gel chamber. And after gel polymerization, the side channels and the media reservoirs, which are these big uh, reservoirs here, they get filled with media. And because the reservoirs are quite large, we can generate fluid flow across the micro tissue uh, just by using hydrostatic pressures, because um, we can just vary the height of the liquid in the top and the bottom reservoirs. And the flow is alternated daily, but the media is only changed every two days because there's an excess of media, essentially. And by seven days, basically, a prefeasible vas vasculature will self-form around the tumor theory. And so here I have an in situ immunofluorescence staining of one such device after seven days of culture. And I placed this image right next to the cartoon that I showed earlier because I want you to show you how similar the pattern of invasion of the GBM cells in green is to the cartoon. Um, and, I, and you can actually see this dense core and the very uh, diffusive infiltrative front. And if I zoom in more and we look at how the BBB cells are interacting, we actually see even more similarities to the clinical phenotype. Um, so what you're seeing here is a combination of images presented in different ways. So on the left here, we have the Z projection. Next, and right next to them, we have the kind of the cross-sectional image where you're basically taking a slice through X, Y, X, Z, or X, X, uh, Y, Z. Um, and, uh, and what you can see here in the cross-sections is the lumen of the vessels. So that already gives us a good indication that they're probably perfusible. And you can actually see the diffusive pattern on invasion of the GBM cells in, in cyan. Uh, and on the, on the left here, we have astrocytes in yellow, 
and you can see the end feet kind of like you know touching the vessels and they're organized in a parenchymal space kind of like in this cartoon over here which i showed earlier as well and then on the right here we have the parasites on yellow and um here you can see they're, they're basically everywhere in the parenchymal space and they're, they're they're also kind of spread along the vessels which is exactly what they're supposed to do they're supposed to wrap around the vessels so to try to understand if the GBM team is right with affecting vessel formation, we characterize vessel formation over time. Because of the size of the chamber, we could measure both kind of near and far from the tumor, and we found no differences in day one or day four post seeding. But on day seven, there was a clear increase in vascular coverage in devices with the tumor spheroid. So this indicated to us that our tumors are proangiogenic, which is again consistent with what we believe GBM should be. So another feature that was very vital to replicate was the selective permeability of the BBB. Um, and we measured this by perfusing fluorescent dextrans of different molecular weights into our devices. Um, so here you can see that basically all the lumen um, are lit up with fluorescent dextrans. So this is a showing that the devices are perfusible. And we measured the flux basically in the extra vascular space. Um, so we were able to observe very restricted permeability for dextrans um, larger than 10 kilodaltons and um, increased permeability for dextrans below 10 kilodaltons. And interestingly, when we had a chemospheroid in these devices, we could see that that uh, regulation of the 10 kilodalton dextrin was increased. Um, and so what that suggests is that we've kind of lost that very tight selective permeability um, to, um, uh, and that, again, that's uh, um, something that is observed in patients, this tumor associated loss of BBB integrity. So that was really encouraging. But I think um, most encouraging of all was that our, permeabil our permeability values are actually in the same range as those obtained in animal models. So here I've just kind of tabulated the scores and you can see that they're all in the same order of magnitude for the different molecular weights. And um, so what that means is that we can actually accurately, um, we, we, we can do accurate in vivo BBB permeability studies with our model which is obviously much faster and cheaper than doing them in animals. But I mean, we're not trying to replace, again, we're try, not trying to replace animal models, we're just trying to have something in between that's going to be much faster and cheaper to do the iterations in. So permeability of vessels is regulated by a series of um, proteins localized in between endothelial cells known as junction proteins. So in this summary, basically, you see there's multiple proteins, PCAM, uh, adherence junctions like BK adherin, tight junctions like ZO1. And they all serve essentially to zipper up the endothelial cells to regulate their permeability. And then these uh, proteins in turn are regulated by factors such as shear stress or fluid flow, or the presence of the circulating cytokines such as VEGF. And so because we saw that phenotype of altered permeability with the tumor spheroid, we looked to see if there was also any misregulation of these junctional proteins. Um, some of you may know that PCAM1 is uh, actually a fairly standard marker for endothelial cells. And surprisingly, when we looked at PCAM1, though, you could see that the immunostaining of PCAM1 in vessels which had a tumor spheroid was actually kind of um, uh, hazy and foggy. It doesn't have this very clear cobblestone morphology, which would indicate that they're actually localized to the right place, which is in between cells. So this is something that we're kind of trying to follow up on now, but um, so I'm going to move on from here. but um, and talk about another level of tumor heterogeneity in the TME, which is the tumor itself. So when the tumor has a solid morphology, there can be differences in the tumor biology because the cells in the center experience a different microenvironment than cells in the periphery. And this heterogeneity can affect um, response to therapy. And so to kind of test this, we basically um, did a very simple experiment, which is to plate cells in 2D, single cells in uh, 3D hydrogel or solid tumor um, morphology spheroids, in a, in a gel, and then we subjected them to various concentrations of temozolomide. And what you can see here is basically that for cells in 2D, they were the most sensitive to temozolomide, quite unsurprisingly, um, because uh, we had IC50 of about 50 micromoles to 100 micromoles, um, whereas cells in 3D, single cells in 3D, you, that shifted a bit to the right um, towards maybe 100 to 500 micromoles. And the most resistant were essentially the tumor spheroids, where you needed at least 1,000 micromoles, which is actually essentially one millimole um, of um, uh, temozolomide before you could see uh, kind of uh, some reaction in the cells. So obviously, then we kind of um, want the next. So 
the next question was to understand if the BBB was also contributing somehow to chemo resistance because there are some studies that suggested that perhaps that happens in patients. Um, so this now is the chemospheroid uh, after seven days of culture um, in the micro devices. And, and you can see that um, the temozolomide has restricted its growth a little bit, not significantly because we already know that chemospheroids tend to be a bit more resistant. Um, and then surprisingly, when we had um, chemospheroid in cold culture with a uh, blood brain barrier, um, this effect, even this small effect of um, temozolomide control on tumor growth was lost. Um, and we kind of checked um, if this was due to any kind of changes in the cell cycle, in the rates of proliferation, um, and it didn't seem to be the case. Um, the cells, uh, tumor cells in the co-culture devices also experienced the same effects of temozolomide, which is due to MRS, but they somehow did not apoptose. Um, so this is something that was very puzzling. Um, and we didn't really understand, uh, and to kind of try to understand what was going on, we kind of, we turned to a new technology, which is essentially um, ultra-sensitive proteomics. So um, this is something that has, uh, I, I show this paper because um, I just really want to highlight that this, this technology has only really been recently um, enabled, um, and which is why it was very exciting to be able to try this, because proteomics is very sensitive to sample material. Uh, it's not like tra um, transcriptomics where you can scale up your genes. You can't multiply the amount of protein that you have. You can only work with what you've got. Um, so that's basically what we try to do is to um, take, so this is just an overview of the experimental um, plan. So we took different um, micro, um, micro tissues. We took um, tumor steroid alone, tumor steroid with uh, BBB, and BBB alone as a kind of control. And then we subject them to um, temozolomide or solvent control. We did live imaging to track their tumor viability over time. And then on the uh, last day of uh, drug treatment, we basically took out the tissue, um, processed it for um, uh, mass spectrometry, and then we ran it on the mass spectrometer. And, and you, as you can see, this, this whole process essentially took three weeks to get from um, seeding to data. Um, and here I'm just going to quickly show you some, uh, I, I mean, you know, graphs are always, especially volcano plots are a bit hard to read. Um, but essentially what I want to show you here is that um, when we compared um, the proteome of uh, tumor cells alone or tumor cells that were in cold culture with a blood-brain barrier, um, we found uh, a bunch of proteins, uh, not too many actually, thankfully, um, but a bunch of proteins that were differentially regulated. Uh, and then when we actually looked at these proteins, um, um, and looked at their clinical relevance by checking if they were correlating to survival, we found that the BGN, which is this uh, protein that was highly upregulated in tumor cells in co-culture with a blood-brain barrier, was actually um, negatively correlated to survival and, uh, cor and positively correlated with increasing tumor grade. Um, and then we, and, and because um, we, you know, um, because these are commercial cell lines, there's always this fear that, um, you know, after decades of culturing, they're not behaving the way that they should be. So we did the exact same experiment, um, but this time we did, we used patient-derived GBM cell lines. And uh, again, we compared um, the proteome of cancer cells, which were cultured alone and as a tumor steroid, uh, or cancer tumor steroid that were co-cultured with the BBB. And we found a completely different set of proteins, which is to be expected because these are patient-derived, fresh from the tumor. Um, and, but surprisingly, when we actually looked at um, which proteins were upregulated in the tumors with BBB versus without, we found a very, a very similar trend, which is that essentially proteins that were upregulated in tumors that were in co-culture with the BBB, they actually uh, increase the expression of proteins that were cor negatively correlated with survival, whereas um, uh, tumors that were not cultured with a BBB actually down um, um, uh, increased uh, expression of proteins that were positively correlated with survival. So all this data basically suggests that when you have a tumor in cold culture, a, a GBM tumor in cold culture with the BBB, we're actually um, creating a more aggressive tumor, and that could be potentially why 
we're seeing this kind of um, uh, resistance to temozolomide treatment. So obviously this is um, still very early days. Uh, and what we really want to do is now kind of tear apart and deconvolute this tumor heterogeneity using the multitude of um, tools that we have available to us. Um, so uh, that was the data that I showed you was bulk proteomics, but ultimately what we want to do, and actually what we're working on actively right now is to do single cell proteomics. Because again, the technology is now able we, we now have mass spectrometry machines which are so sensitive that they could essentially pick up proteins from a single cell. And also because our micro tissues are compatible with these technologies. So it's um, the micro tissues, despite being extremely, extremely small, um, are able to be uh, treated just like regular tissues, uh, which is that they're able to be um, digested to single cells or they can be removed and sectioned, and then um, we can um, subject them, them to a, a range of spatial technologies to interrogate the spatial, um, the tumor heterogeneity. Um, so here, I think uh, I might need to, I'm actually going to show you um, a, a video of how we can um, remove, um, how we can remove the tissue from uh, the organic devices. Nope, not gonna play. Uh, okay. So here you can see that the organic organic devices actually have a film at the bottom, so you can just actually peel that off. Um, yep. Uh, so for the 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 device that um is in this video has actually been frozen, so it's not frozen because we're processing this for um cryosection. So once that uh, film has been kind of peeled off um, because the block, the whole block has been frozen. Uh, what we do is we just kind of push it out, essentially like a popsicle. Yep. And then you can embed that in uh, your your regular uh, embedding media, just to have something a bit more substantial to work with when you section. And then you can do all your regular downstream processing for cryo section. Um, we've also done this with um, fixed tissue. Well, although you can't pop out a fixed tissue like a popsicle, but it's still possible. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to quickly switch, switch gears in the last kind of um, 10 minutes that I have and show you some unpublished data. Um, so essentially um, what uh, we're really interested in is um, I think uh, the main, a, a really big motivation for developing this model is because we we realize that um, new, new modalities of therapy are coming up and these are cell-based modalities. And, and to really test and validate um, cell-based modalities um, such as CAR T therapies, we need a model that has a vasculature, a functional vasculature, to, because that's actually how T cells um, uh, target the tumor. They, they must leave the vasculature. Um, so um, I'm just basically um, highlighting here with this slide all the different possible obstacles that a CAR T cell could uh, encounter on its way to targeting these tumor cells. So the first problem obviously is trying to leave the vasculature. And then once it's left the vasculature, it has to somehow navigate through the ECM and around cell different uh, non-targeted non cell types towards the cell type that it actually wants to target. And then here again, um, this is a very important point I would want to highlight. This is a feature called antigen loss or, or antigen uh, heterogeneity, where not every single cell of the tumor will actually present the antigen that the CAR T cell is trying to target. And that's something that we really don't understand. And it's something that uh, I think um, we need 3D models to understand. So um, here, what I'm showing you basically is um, in orange are the CAR T cells, which have been engineered to target um, a particular antigen on this U87 GBM cell line. And we've, uh, uh, even though here you can't see anything uh, in the black space around the tumor, so this is actually full of cells here. So um, because this is live imaging and our uh, vasculature cells are not, um, they, they don't have any endogenous GSP or fluorescent protein, you won't be able to see them in these movies. Um, but essentially what we're seeing here is that on the first day after adding CAR-T, you can see a very strong um, localization of the CAR-T cells to these U87 um, infiltrating 
uh, GBM cells. And by day four, that you can almost see that it's completely gone. And also the CAR T themselves are kind of dying down after four days. And by day 10, all the T cells have essentially um, died. And what we're left with actually, curiously, we still have a tumor. So, so, um, so this is again, kind of going back to um, that tumor heterogeneity that I mentioned before, like we don't really understand why the CAR T cells are only targeting the invading um, GBM cells and not the um, not the cells in the core. And this is even more puzzling because these um, U87 cells have been transgenically reprogrammed to express the target antigen. So there's absolutely no reason why they wouldn't be presenting it unless it's at the protein level. So this is something we're going to, um, moving forward, we're really interested in understanding because this would have very strong implications for um, T cell therapy and also trying to understand um, and, and to, to, to try and design better targets for glioblastoma. Um, so again, I think kind of very key to that will be tracking the T cell extravasation. So again, um, in that previous slide, uh, there were vasculature, but um, they were not labeled because these primary cells in the BDB don't like being labeled. Um, however, we are here, I'm gonna show you basically uh, Cubic cells, which have been labeled with GFP. And this is kind of just demonstrating the potential, the kinds of experiments that we would like to do, which is to essentially be able to watch T cells extravasating live. And you can see actually, um, we can actually put two different cell types here. We've got an orange cell type and a purple, uh, purple cell type here. And then we can actually do competition assays to see which T cell is better at transmigrating. And here actually is um, um, another way that we plan to um, investigate T cell extravasation, which is essentially your classic histology. Um, and here you can see this is not from the BBB model. This is actually from the liver model, which, um, uh, and here you can see the T cell that has already targeted the tumor, one that's transmigrating, and, well, and these two are stuck in the, extra, um, in the, in, in the luminal space. So with spatial transcriptomics or spatial proteomics and potentially also multiplex immunohistology, we'll be able to under, understand why T cells behave, each T cell behaves the way that it does. So here again, it's kind of just summarizing what I've just said is that, which is that with this micro tissue, um, we, under, we, we now recognize that there's a lot of stuff happening and they're very localized to the, 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 the region of the tumor. So moving forward, um, we would like, we're, we're going to basically use single cell technology such as single cell RNA-seq, so cytometry and single cell proteomics and kind of combine them with spatial technologies such as spatial transcriptomics, multiplex IHC and spatial proteomics to really kind of um, complete, try to um, deconvolute as much as we can all the complexity of the tumor microenvironment with just four cell types. So like, you know, again, this is complexity that we've designed. So um, I'm almost reaching to the end now. So this is essentially my summary slide. Um, this is just uh, some, I just want to leave you with this slide because I just want to, you know, the, all the data and all that is, is really um, uh, interesting for me, because I work on glioblastoma, but um, I think for this audience, maybe I just wanna highlight that um, micro tissues or that we culture in microfluidic devices can really be treated as regular tissues. Um, so we can do all kinds of um, downstream um, analyses with these. Um, we can do live imaging, we can do perfusion assays, we can do um, immunofluorescence, we can do, we've actually done cytokine analysis and flow cytometry and single cell RNA-seq, but I don't have the time today to really dive into that, um, that data. Um, but um, just wanted to tell you guys firsthand that all of this is possible with these tiny, 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 tiny tumors. Um, we're also kind of in the process of doing some MALDI, which is basically spatial mesh spec, uh, and also his uh, so plastic histology and spatial almost, which I've already discussed. So um, with that, I would just like to um, thank um, the lab. So I'm actually in two different labs. Uh, 
One is uh, the bioengineering uh, uh, tumor tumor modeling lab, and also the other one is the mass spec lab, which is probably why you've seen so many proteomic slides for uh, tumor model talk. Um, and also, I want to make sure that I thank all of our collaborators, including in biotech, uh, the National Neuroscience Institute, which is very generously provided us with patient samples. Smart and uh, MIT, who have uh, who which are our collaborators for the CAR T work. And I just want to make sure that I acknowledge my funding uh, from ASTAR and also the NMRC. So with that, um, I guess I would just open up the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Maxine. Uh, this is a really great webinar um, highlighting important work on glioblastoma. And thank you for highlighting the new technologies available to researchers to refine and enhance their research objectives. So we'll move on to Q&A. Um, any attendee, you can still submit questions. And I'm just going to start going through the list. I have some submitted here, and then I have some submitted outside the platform. Um, so Maxine, first question is, which kind of brain endothelial cells are the basis of the blood-brain barrier model? Ah, okay. Um, so we've used primary brain endothelial cells. Um, I know that other people have used um, IPS-induced endothelial cells, um, but um, we've never really had much luck with those basically. Okay, next question is, have you tested if the tumor would also get more aggressive when co-cultured with other cell types, such as epithelial cells or non-brain endothelial cells? No, I mean, you know, I would love to do all those experiments. Um, the only problem is I don't have enough pairs of hands uh, or hours in the day. But yeah, these are all very interesting um, very interesting questions and you know like you know what tumor microenvironment is such a big phrase um and um you know we could also look at like cytokine milieu like we could look at you know macrophages just yeah so we short answer is we haven't um uh, but we would like to um and a new question that was just submitted that i think is kind of in the same vein um you may you may may have already answered this, um, but what this asker is asking, what about uh, parasites and astrocytes? How can you co-culture them in this model together with endothelial cells? So, um, yeah, and so this model actually does have astrocytes and, endos uh, uh, and parasites, um, which is something that I showed um, here in my earlier slides. So, hang on. Can you guys see that? Does it change? <laughs> yeah. <There it> um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah. So um so so we do actually include um uh, primary um endothelial cells and parasites and astrocytes. Um and uh here we've kind of um done a quick staining. So this is like a very zoomed out image, but you can see that uh, in purple here are the astrocytes, in yellow is the endothelial cells, and in blue are the parasites. And so with and then, yeah, here we, with the more kind of zoomed in uh, 20x lens, you can see a bit better. Um, so on the left here are astrocytes, which are marked up by GFAP. And on the right here are parasites, which are labeled with uh, PDGFR beta. Yeah, so, um, and, and we really see that they, you know, it's not perfect, you know, it, the model is not an exact replica of what happens in the human yet, but, um, the parasites do seem to kind of um, spread out along the vessels the way that we would expect them to. And the astrocytes seem to be in the parenchymal space and they kind of uh, extend protrusions out with the vessels the way that we expect them to. Yeah. And now uh, we have some kind of preliminary, we have some data from our troubleshooting days that show that um, when you play around with the ratios and uh, the ages of the parasites and astrocytes, you have um, differences in the vessel formation and the permeability, but unfortunately, that's not um, an area of interest for us at the moment, but, you know, someone could take it up. I should also mention, which I forgot to mention, that all of this is published, uh, and you're more than welcome to read the paper and look at our methodologies in there, um, and also reach out to me and ask questions if you've got any, like, further down the line. 
yes, I'll, I'll be sending links to um, the reference the references um, from this presentation, um, as well as a recording um, of today's presentation. So everyone will be able to go back and refer back to it. Um, the next question is, what's the best way to do migration assays using spheroids and testing the migration of certain March cells towards the spheroid? Um, so, okay, I'll use this slide to kind of uh, reference everything. So. So if you if you if you look at these three images, they're the exact same tumor over ten days. So because we have um, essentially an optically clear device um, with a very thin film at the bottom, that allows us to do live imaging, um, long-term live imaging. So you can do continuous assaying. You can you can do cell migration assays. Um, the same cell migration assays that you do with your other devices. Your I don't know, 96 well plate or MATAC dishes, like glass bomb dishes, you can do the same. Um, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then a couple other questions um, regarding the organics platform. Um, how easy or difficult is it to remove the tissues and cells from the organics devices? Um, it's pretty easy depending on what you want to do. So um, so if I go back to this slide, um, and um, it's basically uh, what we did was, if you freeze the whole thing, um, you just have to peel off the film at the bottom and then pop it out like a popsicle if, you, if, if, you're, if you're looking to do cryosection. Uh, if you're looking to just take everything out and mush it, it's even easier because you just put your favorite um, your favorite enzyme in there, lice everything, and then pull it out. Um, or you can dig it out after you remove the film and then you just slice it. We've also, we've, we, what, we, what we're really interested in is actually single cell stuff. So what we do is we, we take out the tissue live and working as quickly as we can, we digest it with a bunch of enzymes and then we sort it. Right. Another related question about the platform is how long can you keep the cells in culture in these devices? Um, so the most that we've done is um, two weeks, um, but I I reckon you can go more than that if you um, keep checking on them and making sure that they're happy with media. Yeah. Obviously, for every experiment, you'll have to optimize a bit. Okay. Um, and then we have another question. Um, someone is wondering if there is a role for microglia um, in GBM and how do they influence disease and therapy? Yeah, so microglia are actually really important in GBM and um, I would love to add that to the model, but the problem is every time you add one cell type, that's like another like six months of optimization because um, uh, you have to kind of get the ecosystem right. The cell ratios have to get be right, um, and uh, the media has to be right. The growth factors have to be right. Um, but yeah, microglia are very important. Um, they've been shown to uh, essentially be immunosuppressive in some types of brain cancers. Um, so, uh, and and immunotherapy is a very very promising. Uh, modality for GBM. So definitely, I think it would be very important to add to the model. Okay, and one, looks like we have one final question, um, which is, do you see differences in proliferation or hypoxia markers in your tumor spheroids in cold culture with the blood-brain barrier compared to those without? Um, so yeah. Um, Yes, we do. Um, so I haven't shown that data today, but uh, as you can expect, um, because uh, the tumors are um, kind of restricted in how they can grow when there's a blood brain barrier around, um, but at the same time, they have more access to media because um, the vessels are bringing it into them. 
um, we do see um, a reduction in hypoxia markers, um, but we also see, um, uh, and we, but we have, and, and actually we have done the, I did actually show the proliferation data um, here with the, with the, yeah, with the uh, drug response. And we don't actually see any difference um, in proliferation rate. Um, so at day seven, I should say. So, so even though they have a very big difference in the size, starting and also ending, it seems like the growth rate is very similar. Excellent. Well, we covered quite a lot um, and uh, your figures and images in this presentation are so in incredible. Um, and I think we had another question um, about how to get these images, um, which I'll, I'll give to you after the presentation and perhaps you can connect with that with the person who asked the question. I just was not sure if that was something we wanted to get into today. Um, but uh, this was a, a wonderful presentation, and I want to thank you, Maxine, for your time today and for sharing your research with us. Uh, it's very important topics and um, really a, a good way for us to enhance the complexity of how we study diseases in vitro. Um, and thank you all to everyone who joined us today and, and spent your time watching the presentation um, and asking questions. We will be glad to follow up with the recording, um, some references, um, and some videos on how to use the organics platform um, for culturing 3D in vitro tissues. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for everyone. We'll let you get back to your day and we'll see you here next time. Thank you.